I want to really talk about uh, four aspects of the ocean with you this, after, this, this evening. Uh, and the first one is the way it controls our climate, it, not just in Ireland, but in mid-latitude regions. Uh, and secondly, then, the way in which it generates some of the biggest hazards that exist on the planet as the home, if you like, of major disturbances. And then lastly, how it's changing and how it's changing in a way that determines not just medium term, but even short term fluctuations in climate. And I'll finish, hopefully, by bringing that all together a little in terms of uh, the oceans in their global change role. Very briefly, of course, uh, here in Ireland, we're very familiar with the, the role of the oceans um, as uh, a, a determinant of our climate. And uh, we've heard a little about that already. But uh, if you think about the, the, the winter regime of Ireland's climate, if you just look around the coast here, you can see the warmest winters are essentially those areas of the island closest to the south and to the southwest, closest to that Gulf Stream uh, that Richard was talking about. Uh, and indeed, much of the uh, offshore activity in the winter time, in terms of thunderstorms and convective activity, takes place over that warm ocean. The cold pole of Ireland is probably somewhere in Cavan Monaghan, uh, furthest away from that southwest influence. In the summertime, the opposite happens. It's the distance from the ocean that determines how warm we get in the summertime. And indeed, our record temperatures which um, are very modest indeed by continental standards, are a reflection of that oceanic control. And we all know our rainfall is very much determined essentially by the interaction of topography and the proximity to the ocean and the release of oceanically derived water vapour. Not just in Ireland, but of course in Europe. Europe is a very temperate continent as a whole because of the topography being quite low in northern Europe, allowing the oceanic air masses to penetrate very far into the continent. So the oceans really are very important in determining our climate. And the control for that, of course, is by and large the warmth provided by the North Atlantic Drift, that extension of the Gulf Stream which flows at about 16 to 32 kilometers uh, a day, meaning if you throw a bottle or a lump of plastic into the ocean off the coast of Florida, uh, it'll take about eight months or so to arrive on the coast of Kerry. As I said, the uh, oceans control where convection occurs, predominantly offshore uh, in wintertime. Uh, in, in terms of Ireland and predominantly onshore uh, in summertime. And that gives us some subtle changes in our rainfall regime. You can see the very marked uh, winter maximum, which occurs on the west coast, and uh, especially uh, here marked at Valencia. And you can see on, this, on the eastern half of the island that slightly more continental influence. August is the wettest month in the Phoenix Park in Dublin, for example. Uh, very much different from uh, what we see uh, on the on the southwest. So convection transfers very much a control. When the ocean is warm, we have warm weather. When the ocean is cold, we have cold weather. And uh, we've seen a very nice uh, spring up until May this year with uh, very pleasant April temperatures when we thought the summer had arrived. And then we have May where we only just got up to the seasonal average and we've had that very cold, uh, relatively uh, cold May. And that's simply because, of course, the ocean temperatures are, are not particularly warm uh, at this time of the year. The second theme, of course, is the theme of the ocean as the main generator of global hazards. More people die from wind, uh, from storms which have originated in the oceans uh, than from any other natural hazard in a typical year. Uh, we know, for example, that oceans are the birthplaces of the cyclonic storms. Uh, we know that oceans are the birthplaces of our depressions in the mid-latitudes. And we know also that we're at the crossroads here in Ireland of those major storm tracks of the Atlantic Ocean. So we have that to, to, to bear in mind. And indeed, we, we are very conscious, aren't we, of the dyna dynamism and hazard posed by the oceans in some winter occasions. We've seen, not last winter, but the winter before, the destruction, the damage which ocean-derived storms can cause uh, to our coastline. And these kinds of scenes, which we saw so clearly around our coast, uh, reflecting the arrival of these oceanically derived storms, but reflecting the arrival of them at the same time as the ocean was pushing the storm surge across our coasts, 
at the same time as we were experiencing tidal uplift from high tides, meaning that the ocean was attacking new parts of our coastline, which had hitherto perhaps not been so heavily impacted in years gone by. All of that derived from our oceanic storms, and many of our uh, climatic extremes of the past few years have been determined by whether the ocean is in control or whether the continent is in control. Uh, our stormy winter, when we had a new record wave height off the south coast of 25 metres. Um, Eastgate might like to, to surf that one, but I don't think I'd be game for it. Um, we had our cold spring uh, the year before, when of course we had bitterly cold conditions in the springtime, uh, when the ocean lost control. And our summer, 2013, uh, a warm summer, an unusually warm summer for Ireland, when again continental influences overcame those normal oceanic controls. So the interplay between the oceans and the land really determines so many features of Irish climate. Moving away from Ireland, of course, we know the oceans are home to the great cyclonic storms, determined essentially by the temperature of the oceans. We need a temperature above 27 degrees in the tropics for a hurricane or a cyclone to form. Uh, and it's in this zone, therefore, that we find the main zones of hurricane formation. You can see also this hurricane-free part of the ocean, close to the equator, where the rotational forces are not sufficient to get the hurricane spin going. So we have a small hurricane-free zone, even though the ocean temperatures are very high. We know also that these are very destructive uh, events. These oceanic storms we've seen cause huge losses of life in the developing countries of the world, but even among some of the most developed countries of the world, uh, we see the devastation which oceanically derived cyclone activity uh, can have. Uh, and here, sorry, Hurricane Charlie, here's an example of just how much can be cleaned out uh, in one particular hurricane event way back in 1969. Third point, then, is how the ocean changes, and it changes over a, a variety of timescales. And the timescale I want to look at with you this evening is an event which is now presently occurring, known as El Nino. We're actually a very, um, it's a crucial time, actually, in the world at the moment, because we're just entering a, a major El Nino event. It's just started in 2015. And here's a, a, a sort of very strange oceanic event, just to say a few words about it. Well, firstly, we know that close to the equator, the energy from the sun is great, the air rises, and as the air rises and condenses to give the great equatorial forest zones, we know that the air is sucked into the equator from both north and south and deflected by the Coriolis force to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere to give us the trade wind belt. Now, that trade wind belt has an effect, and the effect is to push warm water across the ocean. And here you can see what happens in the Pacific. You can see how the water is pushed towards the Australasian zone. Uh, warm pools of water develop. Look at the temperatures here, 29, 30 degrees um, up until April here. Uh, and that's the normal state of event, when the warm water piles up on the Pacific side, on the Australian side of the Pacific. And by contrast, we often have colder waters over the South American coast here. That ocean is driven across by those trade wind belts so that sea level is actually about 20 centimetres higher on the Australian side of the Pacific than it is on the South American side uh, under normal events. So it's a pileup of water a warm pool of water, uh, a colder water on the other side. Now, those trade winds, as long as they blow, that lasts and that occurs. That's the normal state of the Pacific, a big contrast between the western side and the eastern side. And the western side, of course, we have the equatorial rainforests, the tropical rainforests of northern Australia, of Indonesia, of the Philippines. And on the other side, where waters are stable, where the air is cooler, uh, we have actually very little water vapour in the air, so we have desert conditions prevailing. And on the coast of South America, the flow of water across the Pacific draws up colder water from below, from the depths of the ocean below, and with that colder water draws up nutrients, 
So we have in this part of the world the world's most important fisheries for especially anchovies and the world's largest fishing fleet, all fed by that upwelling of water from the depths of the Pacific. What happens when the trades fail? And now and again, every two to five years, the trade winds fail for some reason. We're not precisely sure why. But that wall of water which has been held up on the Australian side starts to come back, starts to drift back. And the warm pool begins to make its way back towards South America. And when that happens, everything goes into reverse. Now we have the warmer pool of water over here. The upwelling stops. The fish die. The fishing fleet ties up. On the other hand, we have colder, more stable air and unstable water on the western side. So we have drought conditions over here, where we normally have lots of rain, and we have lots of rain over here, where we normally have drought. It's a very strange affair, and you can see the oscillation here between the higher levels in the Pacific uh, on the east side and west side, oscillating as time goes on. So what you can imagine happens in that situation is havoc with the world's climate system. The places that were getting rain are now drought prone and vice versa. So we know that we will get, for example, with an El Nino event, we will get drought in the Amazon. We know we will get drought in the Sahel, even away from the Pacific. We know that we will have lots of bushfires and waves of bushfires and heat waves in Australia. And on the west, on the east side of the Pacific, catastrophic mud flows in places where there normally isn't much rain at all. And those are the strange things that we now can tabulate when an El Nino event such as we're about to experience uh, this year occurs. Uh, the good news for those in North America is it will probably cause the Californian drought to break later this summer. Uh, the bad news if you're in India is that the monsoon is usually affected adversely. Uh, yesterday the monsoon arrived in Kerala. Uh, it's about five or six days late and it will probably be late also over much of India and probably considerably reduced with all sorts of implications for well-being in that part of the world. We would be concerned about the Sahel, we would be concerned about parts of northeastern and South America. Uh, we don't have a definite signal in Europe. There are some tentative signals yet, but there's no real conclusive evidence of, of a major impact from El Nino in this part of the world. In Colombia, maybe we're seeing the symptoms already. Uh, here from the 19th of May, catastrophic mud flow, uh, killed 48 people. Uh, you can see that kind of unstable environment getting lots more rain than usual and therefore uh, not really doing very well in that situation. Of course, when you have a, a scar on the hillside, people imagine you can see a face in the scar. Uh, and in this case, they imagined they could see uh, the face of Christ. But if you look closely, it does appear a bit like a face. If you doctor it a little with Photoshop, um, you perhaps could imagine it's a face. But... Quite clearly, it's not the face of Christ, and if you think about it, it could only be one face, really, and that, of course, is Mick McCarthy. <laughs> um, but, you know, let's, let's leave that for the moment. Uh, certainly, it does resemble him uh, in many ways. The fourth and final point uh, is really the way in which the ocean is changing. It's changing as it warms up. It's expanding. And as it expands, of course, uh, it moves to a higher level aided as well by the melting of land-based ice, uh, and even a one-metre rise, which is probably what we can expect to see uh, in the next uh, 80, 85 years or so. Even a one-metre rise uh, will, you can see, lose an awful lot of some key parts of some countries uh, in the developing world, as well as cause prob major problems in some parts of the low-lying lands of the developed world as well. For Ireland, of course, that means the balance between erosion and deposition is changed at the coast. It means that we now have places that are going to uh, endure increased erosion, which may have been uh, subject to deposition up to now. And that's important because we have to plan where we put infrastructure in the years ahead. And you as the taxpayer uh, will be paying for, for example, this railway to be moved inland in the next few years. 
as it has already in the past century, but it means that we have to take decisions very carefully at the coast about what we're going to do, how we're going to manage settlement at the coast in places which lie very close to the uh, one or two or three metre mark. And even in a city like Dublin, we can now use very powerful GIS tools to mark and delimit our areas which are subject perhaps to uh, inundation, maybe even one, two, three, four metres above sea level. And we can mark out how many addresses we have at those particular locations uh, for each county in Ireland. And we can see how many places might well be at risk from rising sea level in the years ahead. We can put a value on it, of course, because we know how much people will claim for a flood event. And so we can very quickly work out what the potential vulnerability of our coastal communities are uh, to rises in sea level and coastal flood inundation. And you can see this is the price of doing nothing about climate change. Very quickly, even for a, a level of one or two metres inundation, you can see the potential costs are huge that you as the taxpayer will be bearing in the future. And associated with that, of course, we now know as well that the ocean is expanding laterally as it replaces sea ice, and summer sea ice in particular, around the polar regions. Uh, here, last year, you could sail all the way from uh, Ireland right round to Japan and China without encountering sea ice on the northern passage around Siberia. Uh, we'll probably be able to do that again this year. This is the state of play yesterday. The ice is already beginning to break up. It will be September before it's completely at its, at its minimum level. But the state of play at the moment, you can see the blue line here, is suggesting that this year we're going to be very close to the all-time record low for summer sea ice once again. And that's not auguring very well. And finally, the last point I want to make is the ocean has its secrets. And it has its secrets in climate as well. And in the last few months, one of those secrets has been given up. And it, it's a secret which was an answer <laughs> to a problem that we've all had in the climate community for the past decade or so. We've all struggled with the fact that although global temperature is rising and is rising continuously, the rate of increase over the past decade was remarkably small, remarkably slow. And this has been seized on, of course, by climate skeptics to say global warming is over, it's a myth, we don't need to worry about it anymore. And that's been a puzzle because we know that the same amount of heat, in fact more, has been trapped in the past decade as in any other decade. So where has it gone? Well, here's the answer. Here's the amount of heat which has been going into the oceans rather than into the atmosphere. And this red line shows the amount of heat being dumped in the deep ocean. And what we can now say, therefore, is that the last decade has seen disproportionately more heat than normal being taken up by the oceans rather than being used to heat up the atmosphere. And the cause of that is our old friend La Nina El Nino. We've had a lot more La Nina events in the past decade or so, a lot more turbulence and mixing in the Pacific Ocean, which has been mixing the world's heat down to deeper and deeper levels in the ocean. Now that that has changed, now that that has reversed, and now that we're back into an El Nino event, there are some lessons, I think, that we will really be learning in the years ahead. Because the oceans have saved us for the past 20 years or so, saved us from rapid atmospheric warming by mixing that heat more effectively to deeper levels. And by returning to normal and perhaps more frequent El Nino events, as we may anticipate in the years ahead, then our emissions once again will come back to haunt us. So there are lessons to be learned from how the ocean behaves at a regional scale, at a local scale, and at a national scale. And those lessons are intimately tied up with the things we're doing to the atmosphere, and the things we're doing to the atmosphere will intimately also affect the kind of life forms, the kind of benefits that the ocean gives us that we've heard about for the last two hours. Thank you very much. <coughs>